Hello everybody, this is Pascal from Neutrality Studies and welcome to the second episode of our new analysis podcast where I'm talking with John and we will discuss two or three topics each week and this week we are going to discuss Georgia and then uh, Korea, what happened there. So John, hi, how are you? Uh, uh, not, not bad, thank you, yourself? Uh, thank Very you good. for having me on here. And, well, uh, thank yeah, you very we're... much for preparing the, the 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 topics because you're the one who did a bit of digging also in order to show us a couple of uh, visuals about what's happening in Georgia. So please do, um, take it away. Yes. So, uh, well, this is where Georgia is for people who don't know. It's an interesting place. It's sort of one of the furthest outposts of old Christendom a thousand years ago. And it's got this very rich history being between East and West sort of thing, a perfect topic really for a neutrality studies podcast. But what's happening in Georgia at the moment, of course, is not quite so peaceful or harmonious as that might expect. So uh, I don't know about you, Pascal, but I'm looking at the news coming out. And I'm wondering whether we're going to have another Euromaidan in Georgia. Well, it looks very much like that. I mean, the protests that are now um, ongoing and have been like, for 10 days more than a week now being um in the streets that are also being supported by uh politicians from the european union you know eu parliament members and so on who who, who even go there and who speak about it and who put foreign pressure on on georgia to basically undo the result of the recent october 20, uh, 26th of october elections um, it's very reminiscent, very reminiscent of uh, what happened in the Maidan in 2014. Uh, I hope it doesn't go that far, but my Georgian colleagues and with one Lasha Kasaratsi, I did an, uh, a talk about this uh, a couple of days ago, and they are all fearful that uh, something like this might be on the cards. Although Lasha is saying it, the dynamics is very different and there's no substance to these um, to these protests in the sense that there's no underlying actual movement behind them, but we mm -hmm. will see whether that's true or not. Excellent. Well, I think that's a good place to start on. So the, basically what I've heard more or less in the Western uh, media inf uh, information ecosystem is this idea that there's a beautiful pro-Western, pro-democracy, pro-capitalism, pro-market popular majority of Georgia, and it's more or less had its country stolen from it by a handful of corrupt pro-Russian authoritarian figures who have rigged this election one way or another. So that's the narrative we've got. And I don't know how much light we'll be able to shed on how true or untrue that accusation is. But I think there's far more to this story than that sort of almost Disneyfied narrative that we're getting. Yeah, this is this is usually the most the most obvious thing to look out for if there is a very strong narrative spin. But what could you find online, please? Um, so, first of all, I think we should start with the Georgian parliamentary election results, which we've got here. This is the recent election in October, and as you can see, it's a very strong win by Georgian Dream here. Um, so, let's have a bit of context with, with Georgian Dream and their opposition. So, a big issue in Georgian politics is where they place themselves in the world. As we said before, they are in this sort of East versus West position. And the idea is that they've got a party which is pro-Russian, which is Georgian Dream, and they've got the rest of the country which is pro-Europe, because of course, why wouldn't you be? Um, and uh, is that true? Is it fair to characterize Georgian Dream as a pro-Russian party, would you say? No. No, no, Georgian, I mean, this is a ridiculous narrative and I've talked about this with uh, Lasha Kasaratsa several times. Georgian Dream doesn't even have diplomatic relations with Russia. I mean, there is the the, the current uh, government of uh, Georgia is is no more pro-Russian as the uh, uh, as the European Union is, you know, it, it, the the point of the Georgian Dream government is that they do not want to land in a war with Russia, and in that sense, they are not pro, uh, pro antagonizing Russia. But they, I mean, let's not forget that the current government does not give up the claims on on their own on the land of Georgia, right, on South South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so Lasha once put it quite well, nobody has to teach the, the Georgians how to dislike the Russians. They have, there's <laughs> long, long animosities there. And Georgia Dream is not a, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not an exception to that. The, the framing in the Western media that Georgia Dream is a pro-Russian government is, is absolutely ridiculous. Also from the viewpoint that Georgia Dream is the government that has enacted a lot of very pro-European uh, uh, policies, including the association agreement and like wanting to take that further. And Georgia Dream even now keeps saying, we are not against integration with the EU. That spinning and framing is coming from you guys. We want mm -hmm. to integrate with, we want to be a member of the European Union because the Georgians understand very well. Also the Georgia Dream party that uh, Europe is a, is, is a very great economic opportunity, right? The European Union. But if that means having to go to war with Russia and becoming a second Ukraine, then that's that's a bridge they don't want to cross. Yeah, that, that sounds very sensible to me. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't want to go to war with Russia either. And I think most of our commenters would agree on that state. Uh, if you've got that complicated geopolitical position where you are between two powers, then I think you have to play that game very carefully. And it seems like Georgian Dream is doing that. It's not as clear cut as, oh, this side's pro-Europe, pro-West, that side's pro-Russia. And there's a lot more going on there. So I think one of the, if you want to get up to speed with the Georgia situation, probably one of the most important things to talk about is the foreign agents law, um, which has been all over the media. So let's get into that a little bit. So. It's a good this idea. Uh, law this law was introduced by Georgian Dream earlier this year, as I understand it, and it requires NGOs that receive more than 20% of their income from abroad to register the fact that they do so uh, and register as agents of a foreign government or a foreign power. Now, this caused massive protests at the time. It was all over the news. Um, it ruffled a lot of feathers, especially in the West, which is presumably where all of the money for these NGOs comes from. And it provoked opposition from the sitting president, Salome Zorovichvili. Um, so what's your what's your take on this foreign agents law? Do you think this is representative of an authoritarian state? Is this sort of clamping down on free civil participation in society? Or are we talking about defending a country from outside influence? Where does this sit for you? I mean, to me, this is a very, this is a quite simple transparency law, as in, I mean, it doesn't forbid uh, NGOs from taking that money. It doesn't forbid foreigners from it, from giving NGOs money. It only says, like, if you receive money, you need to register here and you need to actually say that this is a, a significant part of your fund uh, of your funding. Right. That's all the the European Union. The, 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 the crazy thing is that on the EU level, uh, you currently have a very similar um, directive, EU directive that is being um, discussed. And, and von der Leyen is actually uh, said like several months ago. It's important that we know in the European Union where funding is coming from, because if Russia sends some money, then we really, really need to know. In the United States, you have similar laws, right? I mean, if you if, if you lobby in on behalf of a foreign of a foreign agent, you need to register as lobbying for 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 a foreign group. Um, this is this is something that most countries have. And again, it's a transparency thing. It's not it's not forbidding any such uh, activity so that this is being branded as as pro-russian and anti-european tells me one thing and one thing only which is that there's must be a, a number of uh, ngos in georgia active uh, with a lot of money from the eu and from the united states that these these actors do not want exposed because if we if we were if we suppose that there is Russian money, right? A lot of Russian NGOs in Georgia. I mean, the EU mm -hmm. and, and the US would want to know that, right? That would be something that they would support. Okay, let's finally expose all of those Russian, the, those, that dark Russian money in Georgia. That's not, that's not, that's not the point here. So, uh, and if we are looking now at the current protests that are ongoing and the, and the, the, uh, the, the, the NGOs, how, how they are actually, some of them are, are, are active there. You do understand that there is, this is one of the major influence campaigns and it is no secret. I mean, we know that NGOs, US, uh, funded NGOs do, um, activities that uh that sometimes under undermine foreign governments the uh in the 
what is it called? The Demo Endowment for Democracy, the National Endowment for Democracy, the NED, was officially mm -hmm. created as as a way to take over certain activities that before before it was created in the 80s or late 70s or no, the 80s under Reagan um, was was performed by the CIA, right? <laughs> and it's it's it makes complete sense, right? That countries try to influence local uh, uh, societies abroad um, through through media and through other uh, um, um, activities of, of uh, so social activities. Um, but the, uh, that then this becomes a major issue to put so much political pressure on Georgia to actually um, ask Georgia not to create transparency. To me, that is pretty crazy and actually very anti-democratic. Yeah, I think I, I agree with most of that. And there is this very well documented history of uh, foreign NGOs and foreign money being used to quote unquote, astroturf political movements within its target country. So what that means is to create the illusion of grassroots political activism by spending lots and lots of money on activists and PR campaigns, which couldn't exist without that external funding, because there isn't the demand for them there. And then because our media is so superficial, I think all they really need is this very sort of thin veneer of legitimate democratic protest to then spin the whole butch or protest or whatever it is as genuine activism. And, uh, and may I just jump in here also, if you look at the way that the protests are being spun or reported on in the West, I mean, to me, maybe you have pictures, I don't know, but the it, it seems quite it seems quite crazy um, because the, the the media here seems uh, says continuously these are peaceful protests while they show pictures of these peaceful protesters firing fireworks at police officers at the at the parliament building and try to blind police officers with laser pointers. If if it was the opposite, if it was the, the police firing fireworks and using laser pointers against the protesters, I'm pretty sure uh, you would have everybody up in arms But but uh, in, in the West. But the fact that it is this side, the protesters, peaceful protesters, using these little like semi-weapons against mm -hmm. the security forces, then, I mean, the, the Western media then just claims that this is peaceful this is part of what peaceful means <laughs> and yeah it, and if you follow western it. media for long enough you realize very quickly that uh, whether a protest or a protester is peaceful or not depends on what they believe and what the journalist writing about them believes uh, because again if you saw these tactics on the street in a british protest then unless the media were very sympathetic to the cause of that protest then it would be branded as borderline terrorism um, but because it's a foreign country and because it's an agenda that the media is very much on board with, you get a very different spin on it. Um, and I think this is pretty transparent by now, right? This is the internet age. People can go out, people can list to lots of different sources and try and work out for themselves what's going on. They don't have to rely on stuff like the BBC and so on in order to build a picture of what's going on abroad. Yeah, it's just it's um, just quite quite fantastic to me that while they're they the media is claiming that this is peaceful, they do show the pictures of these multiple like uh, uh, firework rocket launchers, which are I, I don't know how you build this, but that this is still branded as peaceful is 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 fantastic to me. And again, I mean, you're showing the 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 picture of this Surabishvili, the the mm -hmm. current president who's now um, refusing to leave office because her term ends at the end of the year, and she is again she's being branded as standing up for democracy the person who refuses to bow to the constitutional order it's very it's different to the coverage of uh, january the 6th and the 2020 mm -hmm. presidential election isn't it in that time we were told basically that it was impossible to rig a modern democratic election any suggestion of it was uh, anti-constitutional but as soon as we travel outside the borders of the united states suddenly election riggings happen all of the time and russia does it but uh, let's not get too cynical here. We've got a lot to cover. So I think the next thing to lean on is the next step in this story with the foreign agents law is the diplomatic pressure from mainly the USA and the EU and the sanctions that have followed because of that. So it seems to me that the EU and the USA have exerted this strong diplomatic pressure in order to prevent this law from being passed and to discourage the government from following through on it, which, if anything, to me, seems to strengthen the case for something like a foreign agents law, because it shows that these very powerful, very wealthy foreign blocs ha have a strong interest in changing what's happening inside your country and not respecting the sort of the, the borders and the boundaries between different countries as to how they uh, govern them and administrate themselves. 
Um, and again, why I'll... why would you not want to know if NGOs with like receive for money from abroad? Why would you not want to know that? I don't understand the case against this form of transparency. If you don't receive money and if you only make money through like selling selling whatever it is and it's just pure a pure sales activity, then I mean well, fine, I understand. But if 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 you're getting donations and so on, and it, we're talking about a register. We're not talking about like like dissolving the NGO, right? I don't understand the case. Yeah. Um, I think so. I, I will push back against that slightly. I think to to sort of steel man their position slightly. One of the arguments is that once you register all of these NGOs, that's the first step that you need to do in order to then shut them down. So that if you stop them registering, then maybe you've you've nipped that in the bud. So that's one argument. The second argument, and where I disagree with the foreign agents law slightly, is that the requirement to register these companies as agents of a foreign power, I think, is not going to be fair for all of the organizations which end up taking more than 20% of their funding from foreign countries. So I think there is a case where for some of these NGOs, the government is sort of forcing them to self-identify as something that they're not. And I don't think that's fair. And I also think it's quite dystopian when a government forces you to, to lie and especially to miss self-identify through law. But having said that, that's a fairly minor part of it. And the important thing, which is to register and follow these NGOs, work out who's paying who to do what in your country. I think that's far more important than a fairly sort of minor semantic point. Right? Yeah, and again, I it's just there anyone to think, I mean, think about it this way. If there were NGOs in Britain that receive 25, 30, 40, 50 percent of their money from Russia, would the, would the British government be fine with that? I mean, would the German government be fine with that? Would they be happy to say, like, I am happy that not to know that, you know, um, that you're receiving this much money and you're doing activities uh, without from from abroad? And I, I don't need to know about that. That's just it's, it's, it's unreasonable to expect. Um, and yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, this could be used to shut shut NGOs down. But then, then that would be that would be a separate step. It is like condemning, condemning somebody for something they haven't done yet. But mm -hmm. because they could, we already start uh, uh, punishing them. Yes, yeah, so you can start at a very thin end of the wedge there. Um, so just covering the sanctions and so on. So excuse me. Mm. Uh, so we have new sanctions for undermining democracy. On September right. 16th, the U.S. Department of Treasury sanctioned two Georgian officials. Um, um, and to right-wing figures associated with the violent alt-info movement for serious human rights abuses for their role in brutal crackdowns on anti-foreign agent protesters and for violent attacks on Georgians exercising their freedom of peaceful assembly. The U.S. State Department, which I'm increasingly going to think runs the USA because Biden can't be doing it, also imposed visa restrictions on more than 60 Georgian individuals and their family members responsible for or complicit in undermining democracy in Georgia. It seems like a very familiar soundbite, wouldn't you say? I mean, this was a... The foreign agent law was enacted by parliament, even the one before October 26th, and it was done within the, the constitutional process. It was by done by, a, govern, by a, a government that was elected by the people, and just as it works anywhere else. And on the 26th of October, then you had parliamentary elections, which were certified even by international observers as uh, overall, overall in uh, in accordance with what, what was, um, what would have been um, expected. There were there were irregularities to the point where in certain polling stations stuff didn't uh, didn't apparently work out the way it was supposed to work. But the the international observers said that this is still within the, the boundaries of what is um, what 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 counts as a as a proper election. So um, we are now living in a world where Georgia gets criticized for being undemocratic for having a, have a successfully an election, and okay. Romania is being praised for uh, holding up the banner of democracy for cancelling a presidential election that was held in accordance to its own um, laws of constitution and where the only uh, uh, the only 
um, criticism is that it is possible, not even proven, but mm -hmm. possible that maybe Russia did an influence campaign on TikTok, which is not by itself illegal, which is not by itself yes. unconstitutional, but which mm -hmm. is enough to get an entire presidential election uh, cancelled. And that is democracy, whereas in, in Georgia, having a certified, um, certifiedly okay, um, fine election is undemocratic. It is bizarre. So I've, at the I've struggled with this, uh, this for a few years, because the more we hear about democracy, and undermining democracy and so on, um, the less democratic our countries seem to become. And what I've worked out is that you can make sense of this by realizing that when they use the word democracy, they mean something completely different to when you and I use the word democracy. So when we talk about democracy, I think we're really thinking about sort of Athenian democracy and or Swiss democracy, but really a popular democracy where you have a strong representation of some kind of popular will of lots of communities and groups within the country whose ideas and aspirations and ambitions and worldview are represented in policy making at the highest level. So that's popular democracy. But I think what they refer to when they talk about democracy is institutional democracy, which is something completely different and in fact opposed to popular democracy. So I think for them, the democracy, the our democracy, is all of these institutions, many of which are old and out of dated, stuff like NATO, but also just the civil service and its various uh, appellations and, and, um, and the whole system itself of running the country, the state and its institutions becomes the democracy, um, which has to be defended in a way from popular democracy. And when you look at Trump, for example, you can see that there was this strong movement by the what the Americans termed the deep state to defend democracy from the people in a way. And that's yeah. what I think this, I think this conflict between institutional democracy, which is the system as it has existed for decades and popular democracy, which is maybe the system needs to change, to reform, to evolve, is one of the defining conflicts of our time, I think. So yes, whenever you hear democracy in a media article, just imagine they mean institutional democracy, not popular democracy. I think that's a very good observation. And in that case, in that sense, it's a self-preservation mechanism. The funny thing then is when this when this view of institutional democracy is being mapped on a democratic uh, on the democratic process that works differently from from the one at home. Right. So it claim that uh, only the definition, the, the EU and the US definition of what a democracy is and who runs it and which direction it runs. Only that is democratic. And in this sense, you know, the slogan coming at the moment hurdled from the EU towards uh, Georgia is that Georgians are free to choose um, their own European path, right? The implication <laughs> is you're you're free to choose that and nothing else. I mean, yeah. choose what we tell you to choose and then we will we will deem you a democracy. And if not, then you're not a democracy because you don't choose what how we conceptualize you as what you should do. And in this sense, I'm at the moment, the, 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 the concept of popular democracy or democracy more broadly is being mm -hmm. so hollowed out or is, is being hollowed out more and more that I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting for somebody honestly to say, either in French or in English, la démocratie, c'est moi, right? <laughs> like, like what he said about, you know, the, the yeah. French king, right? The state, that's mm -hmm. me. Let us in war. The state is me. I'm just, this is the same mindset. It's like, I am the institution. I am the democracy. And whatever I decide is democracy. La démocratie, c'est moi. I just wait for, I'm waiting for that because I, I do think it's the mindset of a lot of these, of these people over there who then, when, when they don't, when they're not happy with democratic decisions, they rebrand it as populism. So populism mm. is like the dirty democracy, the dirty, the dirty rule of the people, whereas democracy is the good rule of the good institutionalist, as you pointed out. Mm -hmm. Yep, and we can see that as well looking at the EU's approach to this. Yeah. Um, so they immediately froze Georgia's accession to the bloc, froze financial aid, and essentially held money back saying, until you do what we want you to do, we're going to turn the thumbscrews. And uh, I mean, it's, it's very predictable, I think, this classic Western power move with holding funds until you do what they tell you to. But I don't think it uh, it's it's received very well worldwide when the Europe behaves like this. No, and um, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, gonna, it's not going to work that much anymore. I mean, they used to be the only game in town, but that's changing now in the multipolar world. So the, just as the sanctions aren't really working anymore on, especially on larger players, this is also not going to work that much longer, even within the EU.
Mm -hmm. um, then we have uh, the US Megaba React. Hang on. Uh, we have a press statement here from, oh, we haven't got Megaba, but we have a press statement from uh, Blinken. The head of the Secretary of State, head of the State Department. Uh, the United States has been a partner to Georgia and the Georgian people for more than 32 years. Our partnership has been rooted in our shared love of freedom and democracy and a desire to see Georgia in the Euro Atlantic family. We have worked hand in hand with successive Georgian governments and the Georgian people to develop Georgia's economy, improve its education system, enhance defense capabilities, and expand its health and agriculture sectors. The United States has been a strong supporter of Georgia's sovereignty and territorial integrity, and our commitment to the brave people of Georgia and their Euro-Atlantic aspirations is ironclad. One wonders whether they're more committed to the Euro-Atlantic aspirations than to the Georgian people. <laughs> I, I think they should add another paragraph here that says that and if tomorrow a jihadist leader who does what we tell him to do comes along, we will hand Georgia to him uh, on a silver plate because that's what we care about. <laughs> yeah, well, they Sorry, care about but... in international relations, though, America is a realist country, right? It cares about its interests. Ideals are sort of the, the icing on the cake when you can be bothered to put it there. but. Uh, yeah, as soon as you put the knife in, you reveal it's something very different underneath. Hey, just just um, look at Syria. Just just again, look at Syria and who they who these forces gave power and who Joe Biden at the moment is so proud that this that they took over Syria, the Al Qaeda. If Al Qaeda or some an outfit there does the bidding of the U.S., the U.S. will be with them. So, and uh, in in this sense, the problem that the Georgians at the moment have is that they know if they go along. Uh, they will be driven into the bayonets of the Russians. They don't want that. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be cuddled friends with the Russians either. But they don't want to. They don't want to die a on that hill, right? So in a sense, they now have to manage the Russians and the Americans and the and the ones pushing at the moment for um cons for chaos in the streets is actually the Americans. So this is uh, this is a very tough place to be. Uh, yes, I mean, that's that's the map. That's Georgia. You can see mm. it's right on the border with Russia. I'm sure you knew that already, viewers. I have not taken you for granted. But uh, yeah, it's a very tricky place to be geographically right there. Um, th there's a whole lot of discussion and analysis that we can do on Georgia, but quite frankly, we'll be here all week if we want to talk about the Rose Revolution and the link between Georgia and Ukraine and their role in the expansion of NATO and American and Russian relations and their deterioration over the last 15 years. Um, but hopefully we've given you enough information and to go and think about and be a bit more um, up to date on what's happening in Georgia and a bit more aware of the various currents and arguments that are floating that. But do let us know in the comments if you think we outrageously missed anything that has to be included. Um, or likewise included things you didn't want us to include and so on. Yeah. Um, but... and, keep, and keep in mind, mm -hmm. we didn't actually have anyone from the pro protesters side, and there are people in Georgia who are um, genuinely uh, disenfranchised and who don't like the government and who don't like the direction mm -hmm. and who do want to uh, the, the, the foreign agents log on. Um, the question always is, are, are, are these people then being abused in order to push a, a certain other agenda? Um, or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, we should have these discussions more. But I mean, my my view on this is that um, a lot of this is actually um, is, 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 is guided also from from abroad, it, like also like as you just showed with just this pure uh, um, heavy uh, diplomatic pressure that's being put on right now, very obviously, very blatantly. Yeah, uh, I completely agree. It's uh, obviously we're not trying to dismiss people who have legitimate grievances against their governments and all people in all countries have some legitimate grievances against their governments and so on. What we're questioning is the scale of that in the context of Georgia's geopolitical position and all of the international funding and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm.